Okay, so um, I'm going to get us started. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm going to get us started because um, there might be some more people trickling in, but we have an hour and the hour will go fast, guaranteed. We have a really great event um, here planned for us. I'm going to do some just very quick introductions here uh, just to give you a, a layout of the land. And um, and then Dr. Perloff is going to talk a little bit about her book uh, and the journey uh, to, to write it and her field work. Then we'll have um, a conversation between um, my wonderful colleague, Professor Omar Boom and Dr. Perloff um, about the book. And then uh, we will uh, have a more general Q&A and I'll moderate that. So I just wanted to ask everyone um, sort of moving, you know, towards uh, the beginning of others than myself speaking, um, please uh, just make sure that you're on, on mute um, while we're in this, uh, you know, a part of the event. Um, when we turn to the Q&A, um, it'd be great if you could uh, use the digital uh, raised hand function, which if you go down to the bottom of your Zoom screen at the far right, uh, there's a little icon there for reactions. And if you press that, uh, you will see a whole bunch of reactions, including hearts and celebratory something there. Uh, and below it is a much larger button that says raised hand. And there's a yellow hand there that you can raise. So you do that and I'll keep track of uh, who has questions and, and help to facilitate once we get to that point. So um, with that said, uh, this is very exciting. It's always you know, wonderful um, to have folks who have been part of our community come back. And you know, I say this at our graduations and commencement um, every year, you know, that Haynes Hall is a home to you all, no matter uh, where you go or how long you're gone, and you can always come back, and we're here to welcome you. Um, and so it's really my great pleasure to welcome back Dr. Diane Perlov, um, who received her doctorate here in our department at UCLA in 1987. Uh, and uh, in terms of her field of specialization, it is economic anthropology. Um, she has conducted a lot of field work, um, field work initially in Highland Bolivia, and then later in Northern, Northern Kenya. And uh, after graduation, she spent the, her professional career working in museums. And she's currently serving as the senior vice president for exhibitions at the California Science Center in Los Angeles. Um, she is at present focusing on international exhibition uh, projects. Prior to that, she oversaw curatorial collections, research and exhibit design and development for 20 years. And before that, she served as a curator for 15 years. She's consulted and lectured in the US and abroad on museum work and her anthropological research. In 2008, she received um, the International Service Citation from the US National Committee for the International Council of Museums for her outstanding leadership and invaluable service to the international wow. museum community. She's curated six major um, exhibitions and co-directed four ethnographic films shown in museum exhibitions and university classes and at international film festivals. And the book that we're here to celebrate today and also welcome into our world um, is her first sole authored book. Um, she lives in Los Angeles with her husband, Dale Weaver. Uh, they have one son, Noah, and two grad grandchildren um, who I hear are very excited to eventually go to Kenya with their grandma. <laughs> So we're here then um, to celebrate the publication of this book, uh, which is entitled, and I have it right here, entitled uh, Driving the Sambura Bride, um, which is really uh, an account of Dr. Perlov's uh, field work uh, as a young anthropologist working in Northern Kenya. Um, and, you know, the book is, 
I, I've, I've, I just, I've read it. It's a really wonderful book. And as you'll see, as the conversation goes, I think there's many striking things about it, in, in including giving us this kind of backstage look as to what happens um, in the context of field work and, and sort of turning things inside out instead of, you know, a book that provides uh, the data, you know, it tells us about um, the lives and relationships and the, the forms of connection and friendship and intimacy uh, that become the basis uh, for um, Dr. Perloff's connection to the community. So with all that said, I just really uh, want to welcome Dr. Perlov here and thank her so much for making and allowing us to have this uh, event and, and, and welcome back. <laughs> so thank you. I'll hey. turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jason. Um, yes, I wanna start by thanking UCLA Anthropology for organizing this Zoom. I just, I, I, my only regret is we can't do it in person, but it's really nice to meet you all virtually. Um, as Jason said, the book um, is about my, um, my doctoral dissertation uh, field work where I, I, I did research on livestock marketing, but the book is not about that. Um, the book is in the tradition of field memoirs. Um, it's about doing field work and it's about sort of the messy complexity of it all. And I delve maybe more than others on the messiness of it. Um, I thought what I'd do is go through a few slides at first, just to sort of give you a lay of the land. Um, so do you want to do the next slide, Lisa? Great, right. this is uh, Samburu, this is Highland, Highland Samburu. It's, uh, it, uh, most of the research actually, I think it's got, been done in lowland Samburu, which is quite arid. This is, a, this is a, a much better climate. This is in the wet season. Here's my, my assistant, Simon, and he's herding his father's cattle. They're pastoralists, the, the, uh, keeping cattle, sheep, and goats um, in some places, um, in some places, camels. Next slide. This is what the area I worked in um, was on a plateau region, and this is what it looked like in the dry season. Next slide. And this is what it looks like in the wet season. So you can see it's, it's quite a difference. This is a picture of what the homestead looks like. Um, you see the, 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 the homestead is called a boma. It's a settlement with different um, homes inside of it. You see my, uh, my white Land Rover off to the left. Next slide. And this is sort of the inside of a boma. I don't have a great picture of this. This is the best picture I have. It's, a, it's enclosed to keep a, a, um, the wild animals out at night. It's a crawl with the, with the animals inside at night. And that's one of the homes. Ignore the chimney in the roof. That's a, that was an experiment that went awry that you can read about in the book. Next slide. And um, this is just one of their prized cattle. This is just a beautiful, they keep zebu cattle. This is a beautiful cow, um, uh, bull. Uh, the upward sloping horns indicate that it has special, special uh, spiritual value. And here it is by the Highland Reservoir. Next slide. They also had a lot of uh, birchal zebra um, in the area. Um, there's some grevy zebra, but may, mainly birchals. Next slide. And of course, buffalo. Um, the, the buffalo uh, were particularly a problem um, when there was lone buffalo in the forest. And next slide. And uh, there, was a, there was a great deal of forested area. The Christia Hills were nearby. That has been cut back quite a bit uh, now. But uh, in the forest, you did have uh, buffalo, which were quite dangerous. And you had forest elephants. Uh, you had uh, leopards, uh, impala, and then various other animals sort of on the plains. Next slide. And this is me and my, where I lived. Um, this, I lived in a, in a rural school area and this was a wing for teachers. So I had, you see my door and one window. So I had one room in this, in this um, wing and it was quite nice. It was wood and then and then dung and then dirt floor, but I had a tin roof. And uh, that's my cat, Bruno, um, that is also uh, mentioned in the book. Um, let's see, next slide. Okay, great. Um, 
I realize most of you have not read the book yet, so I'm going to summarize briefly um, how the book uh, how the book is laid out. Um, it's a story told in three parts. So the first part is my early months in the field where I really oscillated between um, frustration at how hard everything was and arrogance at how simple everything seemed. And both of these things, of course, are, were an illusion. Um, I love this picture and the reason I'm showing it is because there's so much going on here. Um, between the relations between, between the people. You see, this is a bead girl, bead girl, because they have all the red beads. Uh, the, they were given to them by their warrior boyfriend. So lots of beads shows how popular you are. Um, she's holding hands with one fellow while she's flirting with another. And uh, who knows what these what this bead girl is doing down there. And it's just a lot of, of uh, uh, happening in this in this picture. The second part of my book covers the main two years in the field. You come on this journey with me, you experience field work, and I go through the emotional, the physical, and the intellectual roller coaster. Um, and you also learn about the Samburu. And in the process, uh, you see the connection between expected behavior and actual behavior. And in this, I'm referring to um, the Samburu working within their culture, and also to my behaviors and anthropologists working within the practice of anthropology. Uh, for example, uh, one norm in working with Kenyan pastoral peoples is to first meet with the elders to get their consent. And this is what I did. Um, and I'll read for an excerpt in the book from page 45 to give you a flavor of this. Quote, on the designated day under the Baraza tree, there was a crush of elders. The meeting started with important business about the upcoming election and why Lale Kipian is running again when even his own father will not vote for him and isn't it time for others to step forward. I knew I was on the agenda somewhere, but I could not take my turn until I got the nod. More speakers, more business, and two hours passed. All the while and one by one, elder after elder was pushed to sleep. The expression is apt because just as it sounds, an elder would suddenly fall over where he sat on the grass and pull his blanket over his entire body. There he would lie on his back as if newly deceased and waiting for the coroner to arrive. By the time it was my turn to talk, the macabre scene had grown to an entire field of sleeping elders, all supine, covered by their blankets, still as corpses. So the description goes on about how I dealt with this unexpected um, activity. And the book is really uh, filled with how I navigate through countless situations like that, that I did, had not anticipated. And I look at the Sambu through the same lens as people dealing with their own real and often unexpected situations. The story format for this um, is perfect for, for what I'm trying to do. It shows how we are influenced by our personality, by our intent, by our skills, um, by coincidence. It shows how we grow, how we learn on the fly. And this is a narrative style that draws on storytelling techniques um, that I used uh, developing museum exhibitions over 30 years. And that um, I, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that more later if you like. For instance, in this next passage that I'm going to read, this is a story of a Samburu girl find her new, finding her way through her wedding. Uh, next slide. Oh, I missed, oh, I'm sorry, I missed the slide. That is a slide of the elders. Yes, that is of the elders and their red blankets. So you get an idea of that from the last story I read. Next story, next slide. Okay, here is the, is the wedding procession. Um, the bride is in the back and she's maybe 15, something like that. Um, and the groom is in the front. And at the end of the wedding ceremony, um, the bride moves from her matrilineal, from her mother's home to, her, uh, to the groom family's home. So I'll read about this section. It's on page 83, you have the book. Quote, according to its true tradition, when the wedding party first arrives, the bride does not enter her in-laws Wukong until the family coaxes her in with promises of livestock. 
The livestock she gains in this fashion belongs solely to her. Because this is one of her few opportunities to gain livestock in her own name, the girl must know her in-law's assets in advance and be adroit at getting the most she can while saying nothing. I've he I'd heard of, ex of extensive standoffs at the Kong gate with the women inside the threshold flattering a new bride and inflating the value of their offerings while the bride's supporters outside the gate shout out their opinions and advice. Finally, the women of the Kong will cough up enough livestock to get the bride to move inside. This is what I was expecting, but this is not exactly what happened. I stopped the Land Rover in front of the gate. And here I ended up driving them half the way, which is part of the story of the book. But I stopped the Land Rover in front of the Kong gate and the best man hopped out to open the car doors since the couple could still not touch anything. As soon as the wedding party alighted from the Land Rover, the groom and the best man nonchalantly entered the Kong without a single glance back at the bride who stood outside the entrance on her own. Resolutely, the mother-in-law walked up to the girl and offered her one young female calf if she would enter the Kong. Clearly not much and not what the girl was expecting. Uncertain how to respond and alone at this critical juncture in her life, she just stood there in silence, thinking and waiting. Suddenly she looked so young and vulnerable. She knew the rules, but without any family present to advise her, she was clearly at a disadvantage and there were no do-overs in this game. After much encouragement from the in-laws to just go inside, the mother-in-law moved forward to speak again. Would she increase her offer? Not likely. Acidly, acidly, the old woman spoke. Don't stand there like a fool. There's no one else living here but me and you, and I have no more animals to give you. With that closing argument, the mother-in-law turned abruptly and walked across the threshold into the Kong. Hesitating but a moment, the bride gave out an imperceptible sigh, hung her head, and followed the old woman inside." Quote. Next slide. And then the third section of the book is about my return several times over 40 years. I recount social and economic change in the district, including my unwitting impact on Sambulu girls. Uh, next, next slide. This photo is of uh, women, uh, after the fact, around 2016, yeah, uh, discussing my impact on them and their daughters and stories of me I never knew were circulating. <clears throat> I thought I was aware of my impact. And um, I worked very hard to tread lightly while I was there, like all anthropologists do. Um, so this was a real surprise to me. Um, but it makes for an interesting plot twist in the book and um, something that I still consider now every time I go back. My hope is that the book stimulates conversation of theory versus practice related to research methods, as well as about social and cultural change and other issues. And I wanted to end by showing um, a number of, of uh, uh, the dynamic nature of this society through, through pic pictures of people, through a number of what I, th what I think are, are really interesting pictures of people. Um, next slide. So here is a young girl, young Samburu girl. This is an 82. And you can see the red, she only wears the red beads and the face paint and, and, and then, and then the, the, it's, the, it's the traditional regalia. Next slide. And in the same period, you see all of the red beads. And again, the more beads she has, um, it just speaks to her, uh, the beads that were given to her by her warrior boyfriend. Next slide. And this again um, are the girls and their camaraderie there. And they, they all wear the red beads and they all wear the same type of cloth. It's the red and white motif that was, that was traditionally worn. Um, next slide. And so this is the same region, same Highland area, but in 2012. And um, nowadays they don't wear the red beads. Nowadays they wear this incredible, uh, these, this beautiful uh, jewelry. And um, this is 2012, but the same for 2014 and you know, up, up into 2019 when I was there. And I asked the women once, um, why do you, why do you uh, wear Maasai jewelry? Because this is sort of a Maasai style of, of jewelry. And they said to me, uh, kind of laughingly, they said, Maasai do better jewelry than we do. 
we do better face paint, we do better okra, but they do better jewelry. And it's just this notion, um, you know, that people pick and choose, things evolve and they pick and choose from various cultures that um, they become aware of. And this notion of sort of this, this um, I think now, uh, an inadequate notion of sort of traditional ver versus uh, modern, it just, it just doesn't work in reality. Uh, next slide. And this again is a warrior from 82, again with the ivory earplugs that were available then. Next slide. And this is um, same region. Um, and this is another Sambu uh, warrior from, this is from 2012. And so the beadwork has changed remarkably. Um, next slide. Again, a uh, picture from 1982. Next slide. And this again was 2014. And this is different, of course, they have beautiful flowers in their hair and it, it was different. I, I don't have pictures from um, 18 or 19, but, the, but there, um, it, the, the regalia has changed even more. Uh, next slide. Those were just pictures where you could easily see the difference in people's regalia. But the other big difference um, of change in the region has been education. Education was not considered something that was very important in um, in um, 1982, uh, 1981, 82, um, and certainly not for girls. And, but since the, the constitution was changed in 2010, there's been many more opportunities for education. People think about education more, um, more um, as more beneficial. And this is Diana in the middle and she's my assistant's daughter. Um, and she was able to go to college um, and study. Uh, she's graduated and studied animal production uh, next slide. And this is her graduation. And um, so she graduated in 2019. She's now living, still living in the area and doing work with um, animal protection, which is just really wonderful and, and necessary working for the government. Um, she was the only graduate out of 6,000 students who wore this traditional Samburu jewelry. And I asked her if there were other Samburu who had graduated um, or who were in at the university. And she Thought there were a few, but she did not know of any. So next slide. Okay, this is just, this is me and Simon uh, today. We had just finished an argument and Simon was trying to, was, being, was trying to make up to with me. Um, so uh, many Samburu helped me with this book. Um, they reviewed it. Um, we argued about it. We settled. Uh, we settled. Decided on on um, on on uh, you know how how to write about the rituals and uh, and shared memories and all of that. They're still a part of my life. Um, I asked Diana in particular what she wanted people to learn from the book, and here is what she said. She said, "Quote: Tell the people, do not fear the unknown. Make a home wherever you go." and you will never feel alone, even if you are thousands of miles from home. And I just love that quote, because to me, it speaks to um, a real a deep Samburu value of independence, of bravery, of optimism, and of the value of a nomadic way of life. So I thought that was really quite beautiful. So that's it. Uh, next slide. And that's it. And that's my book. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, so uh, we're going to turn to the conversation. Um, and I just want to, I mean, the man needs no introduction, but I'll I'll give him a brief one. <laughs> so, no, no, let me come on. This is my job. This is my job, Omar. So, Dr. Omar Boom uh, is, uh, I'm so lucky to have him as one of my colleagues. Uh, he's done research on ethnic and religious minorities, Islam, anthropology, religion, history, youth, festival. Um, He's written many books and many articles and won some really outstanding awards. And he's just really uh, an amazing scholar in person. Um, I'll just mention a few of his books. In 2013, he has his sole authored book, Memories of Absence, How Muslims Remember Jews in Morocco. Um, 
2016. Uh, he has co-authored the Historical Dictionary of Morocco. Um, he in 2000, also in 2016, um, he has uh, co-authored uh, with A. Goldschmidt, A Concise History of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And in 2018, he has co-edited uh, The Holocaust in North Africa, which has, has won awards. So um, uh, with that, I'll let you two have a conversation and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, Dr. Perlov, would you allow me to call you Diane? Just yes, please do. Thank you. Okay, so we just want to have a. This is a this is a, a family gathering, so I will. I want to first of all ask you if I can just respecting the tradition of the of the Samburu. You you ask the elders <laughs> to. <laughs> so so uh, this is a great book. I really enjoyed it and. And I think what I what I liked about it before I start asking ask you some questions, I really like the partnership part, mm -hmm. as far as how this book has been not only written but also the way you went about talking to your former informant or mm -hmm. subject or what are you going to call them to get this product the product we have today. But I wanna start by asking you first a question about the context. If you can speak a little bit about where the Samburu fit as far as the Maasai and the, with their connection to the Maasai, because you mentioned the Maasai mm -hmm. and uh, if you can give the audience here some general information about it and where they fit into in the socioeconomic and political context of Kenya as a whole. Mm -hmm. Um, the Samburu um, are uh, Ma-speaking people. Um, they are related to the Maasai. They split off from the Maasai perhaps 130 years ago. Um, the Maasai, of course, are many different tribes in the south of uh, Kenya and, and the northern and the northern Tanzania. Um, the Maasai were hit much harder by the in the colonial era because they had the lands that the colonial powers wanted. Um, and the Samburu being in Northern Kenya um, had a bit uh, a more of a buffer from that. Um, but that speaking, there's a lot they can learn from the, from the Maasai in terms of what's happening now. Um, you know, the Samburu were, um, they're subsistence based. They were subsistence based. They relied on their milk and meat. Um, when I was there in the 1980s, they money was not a big issue. They do they did use money occasionally, but uh, but very rarely because they they just they were separated from that. Um, but they were in this transition. They were beginning to perhaps sell some of their animals in the in the commercial market. And uh, the government, you know, from the colonial era on, has always tried to settle pastoral peoples. Um, the pastoral peoples are on the borders and that's uh, an area that the government always wanted to control. And so that was always a problem that there was not really a control over the pastoral peoples. Um, and they always wanted to bring them into the greater economy. Um, so first they were, you know, the land was owned communally and the clans, the Samburu clans, clan base, they would move their animals where they needed to according to the, 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 um, the kinship relations. Um, then in independence in 1960s, group ranches started. So then the, the, the land was now not communally owned, but group owned, these group ranches. And that sort of condensed them even more and tied them even more to specific areas of land. Um, and then in the 1980s, 90s, they started giving out individual ownership of land. This has all happened to the Maasai much faster than to the Samburu. And what is interesting when I was there this last time you really see how the Maasai have been um, a lot of their land has been mm, uh, sold or taken away from them um, uh, to people who are non-Maasai um, as the towns around them grow and this is something that's beginning to happen with the Samburu as well so herds are a lot since their land is condensed herds are much smaller um, they uh, because their herds are smaller and they're more tied into the market, um, 
education has become more important. So their sons get some job in the, in the town so they can supplement the family education. So re, the, the pastoral life is really being, um, being squeezed. And that's, that's, that's a continuing issue. That's great. So, so let me focus a little bit here on this note, on this uh, discussion of pastoralism and, and land tenure. Mm -hmm. Can you, uh, so is there an, within the Samburu, are there organizations, local organizations that are trying to push the government or at least discuss ways that with the government to have certain titles for these lands? And is the government pushing for more settlement because more forced settlement of the Samburu? Because the more settlement you're gonna have, you're gonna have more change of, of this way of life, especially given what you know, what you discuss in the book is this rising um, trend of tourism and the wildlife as part of the whole tourism industry. Mm -hmm. Well, it's going both ways. I mean, certainly the government wants to, wants to settle the pastoralists. They definitely do. They feel that it not only benefits the commercial sale of livestock, but it benefits the environment. And that's really up for debate because the pastoralists use the arid areas very, um, you know, in a very logical way. Um, but they can't, pastoralism can't exist in just arid, no, arid areas. It needs sort of the wetlands and the wetlands of course are in big demand for agriculture. So the government wants to settle the Samburu. They want them to be converted to have more agriculture, which is happening. Um, the Samburu, uh, the pastoralists themselves also want ownership because they want ownership of their land. They have not had ownership of their land. And, and, they, and they, so they want that. There are some Samburu and pastoralists that this succeed very well, but um, not all. And what happens is people will sell off a small chunk of their land and thinking that they can invest that in some enterprise in town or buy more cattle or whatever. But then what happens is that the money runs out, the enterprise doesn't work out and they have nothing and they have less land. And this is a continual, continual, continual problem. And you see that in, in Maasai land, you see that for the Ngong Hills south of Nairobi used to be all Maasai, now it's all Kikuyu. And um, Samburu, they see this, they know this, but um, you know, it's difficult to convince people who are optimistic that they can't, you know, win. You know what I mean? That they that they, they have the money and if they 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 have the drive, they know how to figure out the the best investment for their assets. And unfortunately, that's leading to more tribal conflict between these different groups. So yeah. thank you. So uh, I'm gonna move shift gears here and move to the question of representation. You are an anthropologist. You are a curator, and you, the the way you talk and you try to represent people's voices is something I think you try to do ethically, and that's what I really liked about what you try to do in the book. So we live in a city that's about images, and and the Samburu and the Maasai had their own place in Hollywood and and uh, in the in capital in the capitalism uh, industry. So how do you? You, you say something about how did you go about the writing of this book? You talk about narrative and description. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about this. What, what does this mean to you? What is, what is narrative and description as far as going about the business of writing this uh, ethnography? Yeah, well, to, to me, a descriptive, uh, uh, ethnography is a descriptive and they're sort of from the outside in. You look at something and you describe it. Stories are more from the inside out. Stories are things that where you, where you want to um, have the, the reader see themselves in it, you want it to resonate with them, you want it to be more than about the plot. You want the people to come away with a lesson or a, you know, a, a, a way to relate it to their lives. And that's the benefit of, of a story. Um, so for instance, um, how I did the dialogue was really um, difficult to figure out because the dialogue, you know, when you're doing field work, when you're, when you're interviewing people, you know, you can perhaps record it. I mean, here, I, in those days, you didn't have iPhones or anything, but you could write things down as you interview people and all that. When you're participating with people in an activity, you're not taking notes 
And when they are talking to you about their important things, that you, you're not taking notes. That's not what anthropologists do. Part of the work is that you listen, you participate, and then you go back and you furiously write down everything you can remember to try to get it straight. Um, and the language is um, spoken in a combination of English, uh, uh, Swahili, Samburu. So there's a translation that has to be done. And I didn't want to translate this. I didn't want people to be seen as speaking a pidgin English when I translated this. I wanted the dialogue to communicate the, um, the depth of knowledge that they had, the humor that they had, um, and the intelligence that they had. So that is how I went about uh, doing the dialogue. Some of it is verbatim and accurate, but, the, but most of it has to be interpreted. And so it was really important to me to get that tone right. The people I worked with, Simon and his children and other informants, Jacob and Dorcas and others, um, they reviewed the book. Um, some of the people who reviewed the book are illiterate, so I had to talk to them about it and ask them how I could tell this story. And that was many iterations because sometimes they were okay with something, but then a year later, they were not okay with it. So is it, is it, this took a, this was, a, was a long process to go through, um, but yeah. Okay, I think I'm looking at time here. So I'm gonna have <laughs> one, one more question and then I'm gonna pass the baton to, to Jason. So um, I think one of the things I really, uh, that one of the most powerful moments in this book is this connection between the youth and the elderly. And it's so, and, and it's, it's a thread throughout the, the book. And I think it's something, I can see that's something that you relate to that is part of your relationship with this community. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know that uh, uh, gerontocracy uh, as far as the Samburu is, and the power of the elders mm -hmm. is so important to how the community is tied together and lived it, it's tied to the land, it's tied to its own religious beliefs and so on and so forth. But the, on the other side, you talk, you give the example of Diane and you make actually sure to go and you, you do everything possible to go and attend her graduation. Mm -hmm. So what is this? I think when, when I see this relationship and I look at the way you, you, you do the, the you, you go about, the, you do the field work and then you, leave, you put the dissertation aside and then you come back and you write the book. Tell us, what does this mean to you personally? Not only as to learn more about the shift and changes of this community, but what we can learn as anthropologists in order to go back and what we, we can learn from maintaining this relationship with, with the community we work with. Yeah, one of the things that's interesting that you say that, because one of the things in the book that always struck me, when I left the field and I left after two years, I was intensely with these people for two years. It was glorious. I didn't want to leave. We had a very tight relationship. And when I left, there was no celebration, nothing, as I think I described that in the book. And I felt kind of hurt. I had been there for two years and it was like, okay, I left and it was like, you know, nothing. And, um, but when, and it was very interesting, but on the other hand, okay, this is good because you don't want to, you want to tread lightly. And then when I came back, the first time I came back was in 91, I think, and then other, it makes such a difference. And the returning is what, the returning is what does it because I think they don't see you as coming back. And when you come back, it makes all the difference in the world. And when you come back many times, they see you then as a part of them. And so at the end with this graduation ceremony, when we were sort of a part of that ceremony for Diana, it meant so much to me because I really saw we had a place around that, around that group with, when she was getting her, her award. And I, no, and, and I felt very good about, I felt that we had earned our place as opposed to just going for two years and leaving and never coming back again. And I think that's part of, it's a privilege I feel to be an anthropologist and to, and to know this community. And I think part of the long-term um, relationship 
is uh, is really a, a por important in honoring that privilege. Thank you, Jason. I think the floor is yours. Okay, well, my floor, oh, yeah, my floor is to give the floor to others. Um, so I think I saw uh, Dr. Brian Wood had his hand up. Um, I'm not sure if he still has a question, but if he does, he's first in line. And then otherwise I will keep an eye out for some other questions. So Brian. Oh, thanks Jason. And thank you, Diane, for that presentation. I'm, uh, I'm struck by so many uh, situations in the field, you know, that, that uh, kind of mirror, mirror the uh, challenges and that, that you're describing in, in this book. And I, I just wondered if you could reflect a little bit on your fieldwork experience. If you could go back uh, to those two years you spent with the Sambro in light of now having written this book, are there any lessons you would have wanted to have told yourself back in those days, how you would have done things um, or, or any, any lessons that you could share with us or, or the students in our department? Who might be, you know, starting their fieldwork engagements and uh, reflecting back on, you know, the fullness of the, the time that you've spent thinking and, and trying to record these stories? Yeah, um, the language. I would have gotten much better at the language because the Samburu speak English, Swahili, and Samburu, and I rely too heavily on on English and and Swahili, and and my Swahili was not that great. And I would have gotten much more proficient at it, and the, it, it, and that, I think that would have that, that would have helped because I would have it was some and and, and the Samburu and I spoke a bit Samburu, but um, but uh, you know they were you know they all speak Swahili and so it was not an issue. But I would have gotten much more proficient with the language. I want to say before we leave, I see Nancy Levine in the corner. So good to see you, Nancy. Well, maybe Nancy will take the floor in a second. I, I have I have a question, uh, Diane, about, you know, I'm so struck, I mean, the book is for the, I mean, I really encourage anyone who can to read it. It's really a wonderful book. And the thing that really stands out to me is uh, the relationships, uh, the intimacies of those relationships, the struggles that people have with each other and your struggles, um, how those intertwine and, you know, people's lived experience and, and how central that is to the work, you know, even, even if, you know, the field work was about collecting data and economic anthropology and counting and you know, <laughs> archival stuff. And, you know, this book is all about, you know, the life life in its bit grandest sense and mm -hmm. and it's also interesting to me that you end up in museum studies you know and studying materiality and things mm. so I just I, I guess I know I, I guess <laughs> I'm trying to get I want to get you to talk a little bit about this relationship right between kind of the you know counting materiality and sociality. I, I have a feeling they're intertwined for you in a really deep way, but I just would like you to hear you talk about it. Oh yeah. You know, um, the, I, my, the museums are all about stories. I mean, I, um, and I don't work in a cultural history museum, I work in a science museum and it makes a difference. I worked in a cultural history museum for a while, but I much prefer uh, the science uh, museum because it's about concepts and things. And, um, but museums exhibitions are about storytelling. It's all about storytelling. And because people learn through stories and emotional stories um, help create memorable experiences and learning. And so that is what we do in museum exhibitions. Um, so that is what I did when I was, when I was, um, when I was writing this book and also layering it. I, 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 I had the, I intentionally layered the book because people will come at an exhibition like a book with different interests and different knowledge. So I wanted to create four different uh, layers that continually ran from the book from the beginning to end. You can read it as an academic investigation and how my thesis evolved. 
you can look at it as field work 101 and how practice and, 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 and theory doesn't fit. You can look at it as an introduction to the Samburu, or you can look at this as an adventure. You know, so all of these threads I wanted to carry through the, through the whole thing. So the stories um, told that. And in exhibitions, the objects, the material cultures support the story. It's not, that's what happens with a good exhibition. A good exhibition is not about the object. It's about how the object tells, the st tells a story of, of a people, of a culture, or of a science concept. And that's what I wanted this to do. I wanted the content to advance these themes and to serve the storylines. That's wonderful. Uh, so I, I have Tom and then Nancy. So Tom. Yes, hello, Diane. Uh, oh, hi, Tom. Good to see you again, my gosh. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> Well, apropos of uh, Nancy and I being on this uh, in this conversation, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on uh, the Africanists and pastoral courses and methods courses and other uh, work you did at UCLA at the time, your advisors, and what your uh, thoughts are about the uh, anthropology department of uh, what the early the mid '80s when you were a student here. Oh, you're very funny. Let's see. Um, I loved my professors at the time. My my the professors who guided me were um, the most were um, uh, Wally Goldschmidt was my advisor. But before that, um, but I also worked with Sally Falkmore and Hilda Cooper, who I got to know and house sat for her and and Leo. And um, so they were the three people that sort of I influenced me the most. Um, and in terms of uh, and I love my classes and it got me interested in anthropology and all of this stuff. It did not prepare me for the field. <laughs> it did not. And that's one of the things that I talk about in the book. And I've talked with other anthropologists the same way it, back in the day. And uh, we weren't really prepared for the field. And maybe part of the thinking was that, you know, field work is somehow you just, you just jump in and you just find your way to do it. It was kind of funny. And you, meet anthropologists in the field who do help you. Um, but, it, but I don't know nowadays if there are courses on, we got courses on how, you know, census taking and, and statistical analysis and time allocation study and that kind of thing, but not the details and how you meet the elders, you know, and how you do some kind of an interviews, how you do a census when nobody in your entire area can read a map. Um, you know, these are things that are, are realities. Um, but I, I, I just love the, 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 the people I talked with in the field, the people who taught me were really, it was, just, it was all wonderful, very inspirational. Okay, so we have Nancy and then uh, I see Chris Hunt is next. <clears throat> Hi, Diane, it's great to see you again. See you, Nancy. Uh, so when, when I first met you, I, I believe we'd both done about two years of field research. And subsequently I did another year and a half in the same place. And I have to agree with you that I feel myself extraordinarily privileged to have spent that time in Northwest Nepal, which is not my background, this is Tibet. <laughs> but in any case, when, when you were a graduate student, the pressure was going to a, a remote, less industrialized, less developed people and spending a long time and students like some of your colleagues who you may recall who worked in the United States or a near context uh, felt that they were not meeting disciplinary goals. But the situation has changed 180 degrees since then. And the kind of field work we did is now exceedingly rare. Um, it's possible to get research funding for it. It's exceedingly rare and there's some feeling that it is, um, it, it's not the kind of research we should be doing, the kind of effort we should be expending on using our anthropological knowledge. So you're in museum studies, I'm still teaching at this place, but I wonder what your thoughts are on that particular issue. You know, certainly things are not as they were before, but 
to me, there's always the value though, Nancy, of this outsider view. You cannot study your own culture. You just don't, you just can't, it's too complicated in a sense. You don't get that outsider. There's a, there's a value to this outsider viewpoint. And there's some very interesting things happening now. For instance, if I was gonna do research in, in um, up in uh, Northern, Northern Kenya now, and I'm actually thinking of doing research for, for another book, but um, there's a big, th th uh, there's a, a big push for education for women now, right? since the 2010 um, uh, constitution was changed in Kenya. But it's really addressing women very differently. And so women are still in this transition of being still um, held back and there's no value of educating girls in the, like in a pastoral community, people don't see the value of it. And some people really do see the value of it. And so they're really in this transition period and the way that these, that this that this they work themselves through this transition i think is really fascinating to 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 look at because that's happening all over the world i mean women sort of on this threshold of really getting an education and not getting education there's also the issue of the digital divide and then there's people who are really plugged in digitally and how does that change um the economy and how does that change what they do so there's a lot of interesting things that can be, that can still be looked at. And I can, I think they can still um, value from um, an outsider viewpoint. So I think those things are still valid for, for anthropological research. But there's not the point now where you are divorced from your, from your field study because, you know, they have a cell phones and they call you all the time, you know? So it's not like you go up and study and then you're, you know, you never hear from them again. So there's that part. Which I think is a really fantastic yes. thing to keep relations. You know, the point of anthropology is relationships. Um, what, yeah. Nancy, just, how do you feel? Do you feel that there's no value in, in, in doing this type of? No, I don't, but I, I have to, I have to def defend it. And it's every year it's getting to harder and harder. Mm -hmm. And my, my colleagues at UCLA can either agree or disagree with me as they wish. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so um, I am mindful of the time and Chris Hunt has a question. So we'll let Chris answer and then we might wrap things up there. But the hour went really super fast. It's been amazing. Hi, um, I'm a student of Professor Lloyd's and also I see my other Professor Fisk in here. Just wanted to say hi to them, let them know I'm actively here. Uh, but I'm happy to see them here too. My question is regarding the revisions with your book. You said when you interviewed people one time um, that they told you one thing and then the next time you came back, they didn't like what you wrote and they're like, oh, that's not, you know, how do you handle that in an academic setting when you write an interview paper or something like that? And then you find out later that person doesn't agree with what they told you at the time. Do you publish another article redacting what they said? Well, I didn't have the issue where they thought I was incorrect. They just didn't, have the issue they didn't want me to say something. Um, I think if it was incorrect, you try to figure out what the truth is, what somebody really said, but it was more that there was a situation where they didn't want that to be known. And so some cases I modified things if it wasn't important to the book. Um, but some cases, I, for instance, the warrior and the elder fight. To me, that was important to put in because I used that to talk about a lot of things like um, uh, legal settlement, uh, like um, uh, health care, um, the relationship between el uh, elders and, and warriors. There was a lot of meat in that. So I modified it and I, I took out things that were identifying for certain people and then I attributed it to another warrior so that I could keep the, uh, the, the, I, the identity of the person um, shielded, but still raise the issue. Um, another, another issue was with uh, Diana. She didn't like the story of um, oh, when, I, uh, when I went back there and the spiders fell in the food, the sp spiders fell, and she said, well, that's a problem. People will think there are spiders in our homes. And I said, well, there are spiders in your homes. 
I said, but there are spiders in everyone's home. There are spiders in all of our homes. So I, so she said, well, it's okay. But if you, so what I did was I added um, an, a, a comment by Simon that would have been completely logical for him to say, saying that how, could, you know, you should have said something about it. And, and it was in character, he would have said that. Um, but um, so I did honor her, but I also did not want to leave it out. So if it's something that is true and that is important to me, you leave it in, but you want to privilege, you want to protect their privacy. Does that make sense, Chris? Yes, thank you. That's okay. So um, look, the time went by super fast. I, I want to end um, first with another passage from the book, which really struck me. I mean, again, I really highly recommend reading it. Um, so on page 166, uh, Dr. Perlov says, uh, anthropologists seek to understand a foreign people in academic terms for academic reasons. But when we are successful, we also shed a bit of light on this vibrant world as they see it, as it makes sense to them. We venture to the far corners of the globe and immerse ourselves in the center of someone else's world. While we look into that world from the outside, we also report from the inside and try to illuminate what makes it a home, a home in every sense of the word. And this idea of being centered into someone else's world and being recentered in your world, I wanna say for the undergraduates here, you know, we don't get to see you. I don't get to see you a lot you know, as chair. Um, but I really appreciate you being here and participating. And I just want y'all to know that you're, all of our faculty here really care about you and you're centered in our world. And I'm so happy to have Dr. Perlov recentered in our world as well. And I wanna thank her and uh, Dr. Boom and everyone for this wonderful experience. It was really great, thank you. <laughs>